Hello and welcome to Telecom TV. I'm Martin Warwick. We're here at the OpenStack Summit 2016 in Barcelona in Spain. I'm talking with Mark Shuttleworth, Executive Chairman of Canonical Limited. Martin, hello. Pleasure to meet you, Mark. First of all, before we kick into anything, what does Canonical do? Canonical is the company behind Ubuntu, which is the uh, by far the majority platform operating system used to build OpenStack. It's also by far the majority operating system used by everybody, you know, all and sundry on the public cloud. So we really are the operating system of cloud native operations and applications. Uh, and most of what you see here at the OpenStack Summit is happening on Ubuntu. What is going on here? Why are you here as the chairman? Why are you here? What are you doing? And what do you see at the event that's exciting and different? Well, the infrastructure world is going through a profound transformation. It will take many years, and we call that the move to cloud effectively. That, that fundamentally is a, um, a hybrid movement. Right? The CIO wants to be able to operate in a cloud fashion, both on the public cloud, Amazon, Azure from Microsoft and Google and others, and on their own infrastructure. And so this is the leading, and I think really the only significant open source project to create private infrastructure that allows people to operate privately in a cloud native sort of fashion. One of the um, trends, a new focus perhaps, you know, NFV's been going about three and a half, four years now, um, originally very data center centric, if I can say that, uh, very much in, in based in the enterprise and corporate business and so on. And now the focus is shifting over to the telco. Yes. Of course, telcos are very different to data centers, not the least in which the rigor of what they do is the most important thing about it. You pick up a phone or you make a call, you want dial tone, you want to know it's going to be there. How is OpenStack helping in that regard to make sure that what is being produced for what is being called carrier grade NFV is actually at that level. The NFV process really started um, when telco started to look at enterprise practices around virtualization. Today we think that people are starting to understand that it's really uh, a move towards cloudification. Um, so you could almost think about a network function cloudification. Yep. Uh, and really that's about understanding what the best practices are for software operations um, based on what we've learned about the cloud. Yep. Now the cloud leads us to a different kind of, a different strategy for reliability. So if you think of Google, they don't do any of the things that traditional telecoms did, but yet we still consider them a very reliable service. So a lot of our practice is helping those telecoms companies understand how they can achieve telco grade resilience, reliability, in their very unique network environment, which is a very distributed architecture, um, using best practices from the cloud world. And most of the telecoms clouds that you'll have heard of, AT&T, Telefonica, um, Deutsche Telekom, NTT Docomo, most of those are using Ubuntu. They're using our practices effectively to, to achieve that new level of um, uh, uh, economic efficiency while preserving the telco grade resilience that they're famous there is, of course, a lot of hype around all these subjects, as there always is. And I think still things settle down, and the hype gets louder and louder and louder, and eventually, in the end, it dies away. What happens when the hype machine dwindles and you get some reality in there? You can then see, look at it and say, OK, this is a reality. Yes. What is that reality? Right. To give you a bit of the background, um, as the public cloud took off, many traditional vendors looked at that with, with fear in their eyes because they appreciated that they were never going to sell anything to the Amazon, Googles, Microsofts of the world. So um, uh, much of the motivation for many of the people here was to try to create a private cloud framework where they could sell their legacy goods, as it were. Sure. And that bubble is now bursting. We've seen the number of uh, retractions from the OpenStack market by HP Enterprises and others effectively for whom that strategy didn't work. It, it was never going to work, but there was a certain sort of bubble around OpenStack as legacy vendors thought that this would be an opportunity. The smart ones are now coming to a market, to this market, with genuinely cloud native offerings. So for example, EMC Scale.io is a cloud-oriented software-defined storage product from a traditional vendor. So that's an exciting sort of development. But there is a sort of big reality check, the bubble has burst, and now we're down to what really matters in OpenStack, which is resilient, reliable infrastructure as a service, which is on-demand compute, on-demand networks, and on-demand storage. Everything else is collapsing, but I see that as a very healthy um, clearing of the way, you know, the uh, 
the flushing of the stables effectively <laughs> in, uh, and, and clearing away a lot of the noise to focus on what really matters. That really plays to our strengths. Our primary strength is helping organizations operate OpenStack in the long term with economic efficiencies and compute efficiencies as well. Okay, so how do you do that? What's the strategy to be able to enable that to happen, as you say, to operate to keep things up to date as they will inevitably right. change and be updated constantly. Some of the stories that you'll hear here are, you know, that are quoted as success stories are far from it because they're running very old versions of OpenStack because they've been unable to keep track and keep pace, keep up with the pace of OpenStack's development. Our specialty is in helping organizations both operate OpenStack and keep it up to date because the tremendous pace of R&D going to OpenStack means that the most important thing is to be able to have access to successive releases of OpenStack. And we do that through two key sort of mechanisms. One is model-driven operations. Yep. In other words, we allow organizations to share operational code. And that's a real revolution in the way people operate software because traditionally, with traditional operations tools, organizations would each individually create the automation from scratch for a new piece of technology coming into the building. But using model-driven operations, using something called Juju and Charms, we can essentially share that operations code across multiple telcos and multiple banks and multiple retailers. So when Deutsche Telekom conducts an operation on their OpenStack, they're actually using code, operational code, that they share with Verizon, that they share with um, NTT, that they share with other partners in their industry but also that they share with banks, financial institutions, media companies, and so on. So that allows them to make the code operational much more efficiently, much more cost effectively. They need fewer people to do it, and they're able to think about that complexity in a much more abstract and, and sensible sort of way. Are you saying then, that, because I've spoken to many people here who say, no, oh, we're successfully implementing this open stack, et cetera, et cetera. They're not, they're not lying, they are operating it, but it's already out of date, is that what you're saying? Yes, so, so we've entered a new era of software, right? Yeah. Um, it's a bit like a phase change. If you think of an airplane going faster and faster, everything stays the same until suddenly it hits the speed of sound, yeah. and then everything's different. Yeah. And it's just a small change in speed, but it's a very big change in the aerodynamics, effectively. Sure. Well, software itself is going faster and faster, and it's getting more and more complex. If you look at OpenStack, it's a complex, connected topology of many pieces of software. Mm. Now, people who oper try to operate that software the old way, it's like trying to fly a biplane faster than the speed of sound. <laughs> the wings will come off, right? Yeah. They will say, well, I'm sort of in the air, but they're still in a biplane and I'm struggling. If you change the way you think about the software, if you essentially say, I need to encapsulate that software, then the pace of change becomes tractable. And now you can essentially move as fast as the software itself is moving. And that's really the big shift, and that's the big thing that we've pioneered. That's what's enabled, for example, Deutsche Telekom to be on the latest version, uh, Eti Salat to be on the latest version, and to keep up with the pace of change, effectively, of something as big and fast moving as OpenStack. Okay, so you're up to date at the moment, and something changes tomorrow, you can be up to tomorrow as well. So that's exactly right. It's, it's not the day zero problem. Right. It's the day two problem, we call it, right? Which is how do I make that open stack live and breathe? How do I fix disks when they die? When reality hits, you know, how do I operate that? It's not a science experiment, right? It's critical infrastructure and so it has to evolve with the business. Right. Final question to you then. Um, what about looking forward? These events take place, what, every six months, every year, whatever it is, in <coughs> various parts of the world, and, we, and it's incrementally different every time. Um, what will Canonical be doing? What will Ubuntu be doing? What will be happening in this space in terms of the movement of the software approaching the speed of sound, if you like, that sort of thing? How close are you to that, and how far can you go? Speed of sound, speed of light, whatever, can it just continue indefinitely? What's great about OpenStack is it's infrastructure as a service capabilities. Right. And those really now are maturing. So at the very same time as the sort of the, 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 the dying of all some of the peripheral projects of OpenStack, you know, very clearly the core of infrastructure as a service is maturing. We think innovation is now happening at several layers on top of that. You have the container, the process container layer, which is characterized by Docker, Mesos, Kubernetes. These are not, these are not bolt-ons to OpenStack, but they can very efficiently be deployed on top of, and operated on top of OpenStack, just like they can be operated on top of public clouds and traditional bare metal and virtualized infrastructure. And then serverless. Um, each of these is essentially a new way of consuming more lightweight 
lightweight slices of resource. So a, a virtual machine is more lightweight than a physical machine. A container is more lightweight than a virtual machine. A process is more lightweight than a container. And a slice of time on a process is the next thing. So we're helping organizations essentially, because we can operate that base layer very, very effectively and very comfortably at speed and at scale, we're helping them now essentially look up the stack and get access to Docker, Kubernetes, Mesos above OpenStack and then serverless frameworks on top of that. Very interesting stuff. Mark Shuttleworth, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Nice to get some frank answers rather than market speak as well sometimes, I must say. So thanks very much indeed. Thank you for hosting us.